Well, let's stand up and praise the Lord together.
favorite songs probably the last 10 years for sure. Um, if you know anything about what I've been through in the last couple months, um, man, you'll know why I'm singing this with my whole heart today. I'm just grateful, grateful. Let's sing. I love you, Lord. right around the corner, but worship leaders, I started planning Christmas in July, so like, you gotta just bear with me. Um, we're gonna do a Christmas choir this year. I don't know if you knew that. Um, so I'm excited about it. Have I ever conducted a choir before? No. Um, so that's okay. We're gonna figure it out together. Um, there's other people who have done it. Kathy Miller's conducted a choir before. Um, Brenda's conducted choirs before, so we got a lot of talented people who I'm sure will be able to help me out. Um, but if you like singing, 
um, but you don't want to maybe do it every single week, but you love Christmas, um, and you could maybe be con like convinced to like join a little choir for Christmas. I don't care how old you are, too, so if you're a kid and you want to do it, you're, you're welcome. Um, so just let us know. Um, there's a sign-up sheet on the desk at the front of the uh, fellowship hall, or there's an online sign-up. Um, but just let us know if you want to join us. Uh, we're going to do our first rehearsal on November 13th, which is a Wednesday night, and then the following week, which is the 20th. Um, so Wednesday night from 6.30 to 8.30, we'll do two rehearsals. I'll send you some videos and the music to learn, so you can have everything you need to be successful. But we're not going to make you embarrassed, trust me. So if you like singing and you want to try it, there's no commitment other than just like show up and then sing with us in December for that one song. It'll be fun. It's, it's a great song too. You're going to like it. Um, so anyway, that's what I had to say today. <laughs> just wanted to invite you to join our choir. We're going to sing this song that our team wrote. I'm so proud of them. It's just such a beautiful song and a reminder of um, our call to be united as a body. Let's sing. Lord,
got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often.
thank you for being so good to us, God. And as long as I have breath in my lungs, I'm going to praise you. And Lord, I pray that that's the call of everybody in this room today, is that we're going to praise you no matter what. There's good things happening in our lives. There's hard things happening in our lives. But you are the Lord over it all. And God, thank you that you've been so good and you brought us here this morning to worship you and to center our hearts back on you. So that way we can face the week ahead no matter what's coming, God. And we can be a blessing to others around us. Um, you've given us the strength to be able to do everything that you've called us to do in this life. And there's going to be hard days. There's going to be days where we just don't feel like we have it in us. There's going to be days where we feel like utter failures. Um, and that's okay because you're bigger and you're stronger and you can carry us through those days. Um, and God, we're just so grateful that you've given us another opportunity to bless people around us and to, um, and to be blessed by you, honestly. Um, God, thank you for giving us your blessings and for pouring out your hope into our hearts and pouring out your joy into our hearts and that we can face whatever life is throwing at us because there's a lot of people in this room who are hurting and going through really hard times um people with folks who have just had surgeries or in the hospital um there's a lot of that right now in our congregation and god we just um we can hold that um and and be in those tender spaces because we know that the lord of the universe notices us and cares about us and cares about tiny babies and cares about people who are in the middle of their lives and in the end of their lives and cares about every single step of it and um and knows all of our heartache along the way so god i just thank you that you you care about us and you're so good to us and you're so comforting and you give us everything that we need in order to take on the day um, and to bless those around us. So, Lord, I just want to lift up the folks who are struggling today and um, who are going through those tough seasons of life. And hopefully this is the hardest it'll ever get and that everything north of here is, is going to be easy. But, God, you've, you've given us enough to make it through. Um, and even when it seems like it's too much, um, you're enough. So, God, I just praise you this morning, and we thank you that you're so good to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let me introduce uh, uh, an idea to you. We have, uh, every year, we have a couple of line items on our budget where we say we're going to donate a certain percentage of our budget to our district and our national office. And oftentimes I get the question, well, what do we get for that? Well, you're about to see what we get for that because it is a value that is intangible there's no one-to-one -one correlation of dollars to good that you are producing when you give to our district or our national office. But one of the things that, we, that I get provided is the support of a person um, who is our district superintendent, Barry Vetter, is here to, to, to bring the word to us today, and I've already mentioned that in our prayer. But Barry provides support to me, he provides counsel, he provides that to many other pastors throughout our district, and he can give you the particulars on that. I'm quite honestly not all that interested in all the other churches. I'm interested in what you <laughs> are doing and, and how we can support and encourage and equip you to be the best that you can be. And that is draining on me. And Barry comes alongside and he says, let me help you. Let me, let me relieve some of the stress and burden that you have because you have put all of your eggs in your own personal physical basket and you're getting drained. And I need to remind you of some spiritual principles that you as a pastor should know better about, but you need reminders. And that's what he provides to us. He does that for a, a number of pastors throughout our district, but he also comes in and he's going to talk about this in his message too, the, the not so fun stuff of doing conflict resolution and those kinds of things. And we have a healthier district because Barry is there. So that's what we get for our, our donation to the district. And uh, it is my pleasure now to just be able to invite Barry to come and share with you, to bring the word to you. And uh, as he's my friend. Uh, we've grown to, uh, over the last three and a half years, kind of grown together a little bit. Um, he's my friend. It's my pleasure to be able to just in, bring him uh, and allow him to share with you as my friend. Barry, come on. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It is a great uh, joy uh, for me to be here and to, to share uh, the things that God has uh, placed on my heart. And uh, as I uh, travel uh, throughout the, the district, for some of you who may not know, the Rocky Mountain District is one district out of 17 in the Evangelical Free Church across the United States. And our district is the EFCA churches that are in Colorado, Wyoming, and the southwest part of South Dakota. It's 75 churches right now, and uh, 
It includes five church plants that are going on. Some of them are just beginning. And um, with that, our really role as the district, myself and the district team and the district leadership team, which is made up of pastors and ministry leaders that are spread throughout the district, is to help each of the local churches to live out their unique mission that God has called them to in their community. And as we all know, in the midst of that, in that supportive role and bringing encouragement, we do that in many ways. One is that we provide prayer support. Part of that prayer support is that the district leadership team, uh, through Zoom, prays every Wednesday. We pray often for you all in your ministry here. And uh, in that, we've invited um, everyone who's a part of our 75 churches to set their watches to two minutes after 10, which is from Luke chapter 10, verse 2, where it says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to raise up more workers for the harvest field. So I invite you to do that morning and evening to to continue to pray in that direction. And God is answering our prayers toward that. One of them is that just recently, um, over this last few months, Kevin Bowes, who is also full-time with the district, who... He's the director of church multiplication and leadership development. We have interviewed 15 different pastors who want to to plant churches in the Rocky Mountain District. It's been, again, answers to prayers that God has provided. In that as well, as I have shared a little bit about myself and my family, and and, um, as I think this morning, and I'll see if I can get through with the, not so many tears, but uh, I asked you to pray specifically in the harvest field for those who have prodigal sons and daughters. And if you remember sharing a little bit about my daughter, she's been wandering for 10 years, and uh, just recently in August here, God, through his timing and his way, has brought my Olivia back to faith in Jesus Christ. And... Um, With that, my son-in-law, who um, has an addiction uh, to alcohol and went to a recovery program, he's back in Wisconsin now, and recently he gave his life to Christ and was baptized. So, thank thank you for your prayers in that direction, and we really do believe that the foundation of what we do within the district is through the prayers of God's people as we pray to a God who is not limited in any way who can overcome all the obstacles and things that are a part of our life and the brokenness that is is in this world. And one of the things that we become aware of and in my role, which again is being involved in in local churches and particularly helping pastors to be healthy and their families be healthy as we have pastor gatherings that happen throughout the, the district that I get the privilege to be a part of and then meet uh, individually and one-on-one one of, one of the things that's what's happened in that is uh, over the past three and a half years that I've been in this role, we have had uh, 21 churches that have been in search processes. And that's a lot. And if you would continue to pray toward that, um, and Greg Fell, my predecessor, warned me that that would probably is going to happen at some point. But the challenge of it is, is that we have a less and less pool of pastors available and young men going into the ministry. In fact, over the past um, 10 to 15 years, the amount of young men through what's been reported from the evangelical Bible colleges and seminaries is down 60%. And so something has shifted in our culture, something's going on, and so we're praying and uh, talking with one another, praying and seeking God, and God, what is it that you want us to do to be intentional to raise up the next generation of pastors? How do we disciple and intentionally toward vocational ministry? So I invite you to pray about those areas as well. Well, one of the areas that I've been involved with a lot, and it it brings me to what I want to offer you today from God's Word as we look at two passages today, is that over these last three and a half years, 28 of our 75 churches have encountered some level of conflict that they've asked me to be involved with. Let me repeat that again. 28, over a third of our churches in the three and a half years that I've been here have 
gone through some type of reality of conflict. And we shouldn't be surprised by that in some ways. In fact, as you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, beginning in Genesis 3, we see the, the reality of the spiritual battle of the enemy of our souls and the one who hates you and your family and the church seeks to bring division and he division and he has tried to bring division between Adam and Eve and God and between Adam and Eve themselves so that we would not live out the, the purpose that God has created us for and to give God glory and, and for us to join him in his work and what he's doing to reconcile the world to himself that we get to be a part of. But the reality is that he attacks and the world itself is not interested in reconciliation. We're right in the middle of a political process, right? And the things that we see that are in the culture sometimes seep into our own hearts and souls. You see what goes on between marriage and husband and wife today and sometimes children and parents and brothers and sisters in Christ. And the, the reality is this ongoing battle, Jesus is offering a different path. In fact, the very heart of the gospel itself is about reconciliation. It's God rescuing us, doing what we couldn't do for ourselves when we were his enemy. And that he came in the world through his life and his death and his resurrection and the sending of the Spirit to give us hope that we could be reconciled with God and as a result of that, we could be reconciled with one another. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus prayed in John 17 when he said, may they all be one in the same way that you and I, Father, are one. May they be one with us and one with one another so that the world will know that he has been sent. And Jesus ultimately is the answer to the realities of the brokenness that we see in this world, that we would learn to come to him and, and trust him and surrender our lives to him. And so as I was thinking about what to, to bring uh, to, to all of you today, I want to look at uh, two passages. And you'll see there on the screen that this kind of four G's of biblical peacemaking is that we start with glorifying God which means that we come to him, we want him worshiped, we want him to be glorified in and through our lives, our actions, our words, and so forth. And then we get to the real issue. How do we deal with the realities of what's inside of us that we need to look at when there's conflict in our relationships with, with one another? In fact, we, we believe this is such a big issue as I, again, the, the district leadership team is spread throughout the district. They're pastors and ministry leaders, and they see the reality of conflict and so forth that over the next three years in 2025, 2026, and 2027, we're going to be very intentional within the district to provide opportunities and teaching through our conferences, what we do in our pastor gatherings, what we do geographically in areas to begin to deal and create a grace culture, a peacemaking culture, not a peacekeeping culture, but a peacemaking culture that frees, again, all of us to be able to join God in his work. And so when the temptation comes for us to give into conflict in a way in which we don't experience reconciliation, that we can again follow a different path. And so it's not only from the the church level, it comes down to the reality of our families as well because the church is made up of individuals and families. And so this whole aspect of getting the log out of your own eye is what we want to look at today. But I want to start where we need to always start. And I've provided, again, a PowerPoint that are outside the door there. I, I'm not going to probably get to every aspect of that today, but you can take it home and for yourself personally, maybe talking with your own families about this. But also, all of you probably know some people who are experiencing conflict and division right now that God could use you to be a disciple maker, to disciple other people of how to overcome that in their lives. So the foundation we want to look at, and we could look at many passages from Luke chapter 14, verses 25 to 33. And, and, and the reason why I start here is because the journey for all of us is coming to the place, even as we sang earlier, about what does it mean for me to, to really to surrender to God? And one of the areas where we struggle the most in surrendering is in the area when we have a conflict with another person. Will I trust him? Will I humble myself? You know, we sing that old hymn, I surrender some, right? 
No, we sing what? I surrender all. Now, I grew up in the church. My parents were faithful in terms of developing, helping me to see what it means to follow Jesus. But the reality is I wasn't a Christian when I was a young person. When I was 19, I was really confronted with the reality that I was not really surrendering all. I wasn't even surrendering some. I, I kind of played the, the church game and went to, again, youth group and church and all those kind of things, but it wasn't really inter internalized. You see, I wanted Jesus on my own terms. And so I was at a campus crusade for Christ Christmas conference in, in uh, December of 1981, and God had prepared my heart for me to be born again, and it was this, this passage that God used to bring me to my knees as I began to evaluate my life and my relationship and what does it mean to, to, to submit your life to his loving lordship, Jesus' loving lordship, his empowering presence, the reality that I needed a savior, that I needed to be honest with myself and the mirror of God's word reflecting back at me of where I was as a 19-year-old. As a Notice what Jesus says here. He said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Be a follower of Jesus. To be a Christian. That if I place anything in my life and he gets to the heart of the matter for most of us. If I even elevate the reality of my family and make them the thing that I worship, I can be guilty of idolatry and that very thing that I am elevating above God can be the very thing that controls my life and robs me of the reality of God leading me in that to how can I really love my family or even as husbands and myself Love my wife as Jesus loved the church. He's warning us here that if I don't renounce, if I don't give it all to him and say, God, what do you want to do with everything that I have, which is a gift from you anyway? I own nothing. I still remember as a 19-year-old understanding that that's what Jesus was asking me to do and how to trust him. And in the midst of it, in the concept of uh, grace and living in grace, that it frees me to be honest and you and I to be honest about the realities of sometimes that we hold on to things and we don't surrender and we elevate our own pride in what we want higher than what God wants. And so he is inviting us to learn and start in this place of submission. And so I would invite you as I am inviting myself today, am I, is there something in my life I need to renounce? My time, my talents, my retirement, my, my work, my relationships, do I need to offer that to him? Because if I don't, it's only a matter of time before there's going to be some kind of conflict. And so what I want to offer you is the starting point is we now use a Bible study method that I'm going to just briefly again talk about as we go through this next passage in Matthew chapter 7. But it's an inductive study method of how we can get the meaning out of the text in, in God's word. Some of you have probably used this in your own life. And so, again, uh, as the starting point that we want the Holy Spirit to be our teacher, as I've been praying for all of you today, that God would search my heart and see if there's any hardness, anything there would get in the way for me, not only really hearing, but then putting the word into practice, that we would ask him to do that. And then we get into the word, and we, we look at it, and we begin to observe from the text. We use questions to ask about the text, like who is being talked to at the moment? What is it really talking about who God is? When is this happening? And maybe the, the story of God and what he is doing from Genesis to Revelation or the, the book of the Bible that we're studying. Where is it happening? And who are the people that are there? Why is God saying these things at this moment? And, and how am I going to respond to that? And so you begin to ask inquisitive questions. Then you get to interpretation, to accurately interpret the Bible. And so we start with context. 
And as we interpret anything in the Bible, we cannot just look at an individual word or even a verse, but we look at the chapter, the, the book of the Bible itself. What genre is the Bible written in? Is it written in a story? Is it a parable? Is it a, just a didactic straight teaching? Is it, how does it fit in with if it's in the Gospels? Or how does it fit in the Old Testament or New Testament or the entire story from Genesis to Revelation? And then you historically look at the context and the original intent that God had for those people at that time and then decide whether this is descriptive of something I should do or is it prescriptive? Is it exactly what God is asking me to do here in the same way as these individuals? So it takes into consideration culture and the different cultures in which the Bible was written to. We look at the grammar itself. Since we believe that the, the Bible is inherent, it is inspired in the very words that are used. So the, the grammar of the words, what tense is it? Is it present tense? Is it past? Is it an imperative? Is it a command? And then the redemptive aspect of it is it's fed through the reality of the life of Jesus and who he is because all the scripture points to him. And so in, in our interpretation, we want to get an accurate interpretation for the purpose then that we can glorify God by applying the text to our life, what I call dependent life application. And most of the time, the Bible is applied specifically to our relationships that God has given us. And so let's look at this, 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 uh, this passage here in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And so I'm going to read this, and then we're going to use this method and go through this today, and then you can spend more time later today and throughout this week to see how God is going to permeate this in your own context for yourself or for influence to help other people to also to overcome conflict in their lives. Again, as my seminary professor reminded me many years ago, he said it's not so much that we read the Bible, that, but we allow the Word of God to read us. As we look, God, what are you saying about us, about me, in terms of my own life? And so he begins here in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, and he says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This, this aspect is what I call the step of humility. It's the most important trait of our lives that we humble ourselves before God and we allow the, the word of God to be a mirror to us, reflect back of what God is seeing in our lives so that we can be reconciled to him and, and do our part in being reconciled to other people. So let's just start just with a couple of observations from this passage, the context of it. Again, the story of God from Genesis to Revelation is about restoring broken relationships. Life is about relationships. And Matthew is what we call a bridge gospel from the Old Testament to the New Testament. It talks a lot about the kingdom. It talks a lot about the Old Testament and its fulfillment in the life of Jesus. And in this section here, it's this Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus is describing the kingdom of God. Jesus came and he said, repent from the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand. He's offering a, a different kingdom than the world that we live in, which is focused on so much of just the, what we can see and the, the government and all those kind of things, which was why the people of Jesus' day were so confused because they thought Jesus was going to be some type of political messiah. But he was talking about the spiritual kingdom, the things that will last. And, and in that, throughout this book, but in particular in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he's dealing with the heart of what really needs to change in this world in relationships. And he says, it's us. 
that the problem that goes on in conflict is, is us. It's what's in our own heart. It's what we're really believing. It's how we're seeing the people around us. And so he's speaking to the crowds and he's speaking to the followers. By extension, though, he is speaking to all of us that are here. Jesus said in Matthew 28, he said, if you're going to give your life to something, you give your life to making disciples. And in that, as he says, as you make a disciple, you are to teach them to obey all that I've commanded you. And so we take that first in terms of obedience and not just hearing the word of God to, just for knowledge's sake, but to say, God, how am I to apply this and obey this? How do I help others to do this as well? And why is he teaching on this? Well, the immediate context here is that he's talking about this false righteousness in which we minimize God's word and what he's saying and keeping our focus on other people and that leads to a false judgment and an incorrect judgment because God is primarily speaking to us. And then if that happens, there will be no hope to resolve broken relationships. And so he's inviting us to be honest about where we're at. And that leads to the second step then of interpretation. And so what I want to do is just take this one word, judge or judgment, and, and look at the historical and the meaning of what this word means. Because it includes ourselves, it includes the others around us, it includes us in terms of my relationship with you and your relationship with me. And the reality is we will always make evaluations and judgments all the time. It's really hard not to do that. We're reading people's body language, we're hearing their words, we're interpreting what they're saying, and Sometimes those interpretations may not be correct or right, but the word judgment itself means to distinguish, to decide. It can mean in certain contexts to condemn or to decree something over somebody. It's to evaluate or call into question. And when Jesus is saying these words here, he's not saying that we are not to ever to evaluate and judge things. What he is saying is, what is the standard by what you're doing it? And are you starting with yourself first? That's the humility part. Because he's reminding us here in these verses that we will be judged in the future when we stand before God one day. We are being judged in the present moment for, again, how we are reflecting or not reflecting. Do we have integrity with what we say we believe as followers of Jesus, but what's been seen in our lives? And that he gets to the important reality here that we must see ourselves clearly before we can help others. Because God does use us in each other's lives. The greatest person that God has used in my own life is my wife. Where she can help. And, what, and what's going on in my life, my, my words or my actions. And I invite her into that. God uses her. But the reality is when we're invited into that, we have to be careful, as even Galatians 6 talks about, that we have to start with ourselves first, our own condition. God, how am I doing these very areas that I'm seeing in another brother or sister in Christ? And do what I want, what you want more than anything else, which is to live out the gospel, which means brothers and sisters are to be reconciled with each other. And the, and the glue that brings it all together when we begin to start there with ourselves to look at the log or the national forest in our own eyes first so that we're free to be able to help another person and walk with them is the reality of redemption. That we need to be humbled by the reality of what Jesus has done that he willingly gave himself up, and Philippians describes it in Philippians 2, is that he humbled himself. That the God of the universe, who speaks things into existence, became like us, so that you and I would have hope on this day, on October 20th, for all the things that we encounter in life, and how to restore broken relationships. That's why he came to rescue us, to provide redemption. And so as we understand this interpretation then that God is speaking in this picture, particular passage that we would look at ourselves first and humble ourselves and 
and get things right with God first before we can get things right with other people or even be involved with the process of reconciliation. He invites us now not just to know these things, but to actually put it into practice. And so there's five basic steps here. I'm not going to go through them in depth because I don't have time today. But I want you to spend some time there. And the first application that we need to consider here, the first step is before you talk to others about their faults, Jesus wants you to face up to yours, which leads us to confession. And what confession ultimately is, is I'm agreeing with God. I'm agreeing with his evaluation as he looks at my life and he loves me and doesn't want me to stay stuck and in bondage to my, my sin and my selfishness and my unwillingness to be reconciled with other people or forgive. He's saying it starts with ourselves first. And so we say, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. Anything that's getting in the way of my relationship with you first, Lord, or with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's the first step, and it's a step that we live out over and over and over again. And as we, as we then go to the second step, we begin to ask ourselves, what is my role in the conflict? What is the issues that are really separating me from you? What is it really all about? And there's a lot of interpretation with that, isn't it? It's amazing to me and the conflicts that I've had and even with, within my own family, you have seven children, you're gonna have a lot of conflict at times and helping them through that and even the 28 churches that I've been helping over the last three and a half years it's amazing how many times what we think the real issue is is not the real issue. And so understanding what that issue is, which is, again, step three, that we would move and we agree upon what those issues are and ask ourselves, is this worth being divided over? And what if we don't resolve this? What will the implications be? And again, what I pointed out earlier from Jesus' prayer in John 17 is that what's at stake for the church if we don't humble ourselves and reconcile with one another for kingdom purposes that God would be glorified is that the world will be confused about Jesus' message. Because Jesus came that we would be, again, reconciled with the Father. And out of that then, that we would want what God wants and that we would want that in our relationships because it's the only hope the world is going to have to overcome its brokenness. And so will I follow him in that? Will I surrender in that? And to understand in step four that the only thing that I can ultimately control is my own response. And sometimes what gets in the role, in the way of my role in restoring the relationship is what's in my own heart. And sometimes what can happen is that I end up worshiping something else, an idol, instead of worshiping God, because maybe I want my way. <laughs> and if we're all honest here, every single one of us, in some way, is a control freak. There's something that we want to control in our lives, the, the outcomes or the people, or we believe there are some things in our life that we have to have to be happy, which is ultimately a lie if it's outside of Jesus. And so in that, he's inviting us to use the word of God to discern the intentions and thoughts of my heart. Am I doing my part completely and being at peace with everyone as much as it depends on me, which is the step five then, that the only thing that will free me up is that I begin to worship the one true God in everything that's a part of my life. And when I recognize I'm not doing that, that I immediately repent of that. And I ask God for his grace to help me to overcome that. And so this last slide here is just some questions that may be helpful to you as you seek to apply this to your own life and, and this last part of what I call grace steps, these seven areas that you might want to consider not only for your own family or for maybe your own uh, ministry teams or for other people around you is to start with addressing everyone involved, specifically yourself, 
all the reality is that sin never just affects you. When we choose not to trust God and we sin, it, it affects other people around us even when we're not aware of it. Secondly, uh, avoid the, the kind of what I call excuse aspects, if or but and maybe. Just be honest and straightforward with the reality of my contribution in the conflict that's going on and admit specifically what those things are as the person shows me a mirror of how I've hurt them or how I've been involved. Acknowledge the hurt. Even if your intention was not to hurt the person and they were hurt anyway, say, I'm really sorry that I hurt you in that. To accept the consequences of that. There may be consequences based on the, the nature of the conflict. And then six, all begin to alter your behavior toward that other person. And the way that we alter it is that Jesus told us to love our neighbors. We love ourselves. We are to love our enemies. We're not to withhold. We are to love as Jesus loves us completely. And, but also allow the space and time for forgiveness to happen to bring freedom in your life and the other person's life so that you don't become bitter or we don't follow what the world says in terms of throwing away relationships. And all of this, again, has started out as I started my message today that I, I need to renounce my ownership of everything in my life, even sometimes the, the reality of being, quote, right. And that I'm willing to not elevate my preferences and my desires more than what God is desiring and wants. So I'm hoping this will help and as I communicate with Matt through, Pastor Matt through, communicate with Matt the reality of different things that we will be doing in the district and inviting you to be a part of our conferences and even some of the geographical things that we'll do maybe just in the Denver area and Colorado Springs and where the churches are located together, that you would choose to be a part of that. And there's even some free things that we'll offer uh, in terms of just uh, Wisdom 360, which used to be called Peacemakers with Ken Sandy. I just had a conversation with him and his staff about two weeks ago to talk about how we can be more intentional with this within the churches that are a part of the Rocky Mountain District. And so would you join me in prayer for the opportunity to be together? And uh, you, you know our hearts. You know what's going on in each one of our relationships and beginning in our relationship with you. Lord, I, I know there were many times where I was trying to control the whole way too tightly on to the reality of what was going on with my daughter and my son-in-law. And even though I, at times, uh, didn't trust you and lived in unbelief, um, you did an amazing thing and surprised all of us in how you worked and when you worked. And, and so, God, I'm thankful today for even the, the reality of your grace that even when we don't trust you and live in unbelief at times, it, it doesn't stop you from working, your plan and your purposes. God, I pray for this congregation. I pray that they would live the, the peace-making life, that they would understand grace in such a deep way that it would free them to be honest with you and with one another. I pray for Pastor Matt and the elders and the staff that is here and ministry leaders for your protection over them. Lord, all we have to do is read the New Testament and we see the, the, again, the reality of your desire that we would be unified in a, in a way that would live out in a very demonstrative way what the gospel is all about. And so as this congregation continues to trust you and live out their mission, I pray for your grace to be poured out for those that do not have a relationship with you, that they would come to know you and, and be a part of this, this church family. So again, thank you, Lord, for this time today. We look forward to seeing how you work in and through us to live this out. And we pray this in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. amen.